let's get to the most important thing of all that we came for today. Will you bow your hearts with me one more time, Lord? Father God, we thank you for this day. I thank you for every single person that you've drawn here this morning. There is no one here, absolutely no one here by accident or by um, coincidence, Lord. You knew exactly who would be here. You knew who was going to come and hear what was going to be shared this morning. And so, Father, I pray, Lord, that you would use me, Lord. Lord, that all of Reggie would fall away, Lord, and they would just hear from you, Lord. And, Lord, as, as, as Jason said, Lord, that we would not only hear it, it would just be ear knowledge, Lord, but knowledge that we would take and put into our hearts, Lord, and then act upon it, Lord. So, Father, we ask your blessing upon this time and that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. So three weeks ago, three, about three weeks ago, I preached a message called The Sweet Smell of Prayer, um, which was about praying with faith praying with confidence, praying, trusting the Lord, praying without doubting that he is who he says he is, and he will do what he says he's going to do. Because a lot of times, one of the things that we do is we kind of pray, as I mentioned before, kind of, well, Lord, if, if you can, you know, maybe, just in case, our prayers aren't filled with that power that we have given through Christ, okay? The power to move that mountain to the sea, to do great works, okay? So this message is going to be kind of a follow-up on that message. If you turn in your Bibles to Psalm 27, this will kind of sort of tell you where we're going to go, if you haven't already guessed. Psalm 27 Just one verse. And by the way, keep your Bibles out because we are going to be running through the Bible tonight, this morning. We're going to look at a lot of verses. Just one verse here, verse 14. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, we as Americans have the hardest time waiting, right? Right? I don't know anyone that likes to wait. We want everything now. And we in our society is, is leaning towards that way, right? Even in the, in the commercial industry, we have instant coffee, we have microwaves. We want, we, we, computers came out and the first thing we wanted was a faster computer, right? Everybody wants a faster computer. And the list goes on and on. No one wants to wait on anything. We want everything now. Um, we don't want to wait in line. We don't want to wait in traffic. How many of you guys have to wait in traffic when you come home and you're like grabbing the steering wheel, come on, come on, you know? In fact, you know, if you ride with Pastor Dave, he owns every road when he's out there Absolutely. and he does not wait, okay? on the shoulder, through the forest, whatever it takes for him to get where he's going, <laughs> he's going to get you there, okay? But we don't want to wait in line or in traffic. We don't want to wait for a food service. You know, if we go to a restaurant and it takes more than five minutes, we're, we got the fork and knife in hand, where's my food? We're, we're, we're so impatient. We're waiting for uh, proposals. Um, biding our time is not... A, not um, a counterculture uh, is, is, is more of a countercultural thing than it's ever been. I think it's worse for the Christian because we, as Christians, really don't want to wait. But the most important exhortation, or one of the most important exhortations of the Bible, is the call to do what? Wait on the Lord, right? We're called to wait on the Lord. David said in Psalm 69, 3, I am weary with crying, my throat is parched, my eyes fail while I wait for my God. Even though God promises special blessings for waiting, waiting is one of the most difficult exhortations of scriptures. Would you agree? Yeah. Why is it so hard? Because as part of the fallen humanity, we are so prone to take matters into our own hands. 
to follow our own schemes. We want everything yesterday, and we want it the way we want it, when we want it, how we want it, right? Even as a Christian, when it comes to the Lord, when we pray, we pray, Lord, I need this, do that, but we want that prayer answered yesterday, okay? But we kind of say in our hearts and in our mind, it's my way or the highway. That's not quite how it works for God. God doesn't operate on our schedule, and expecting that he will is when disappointment comes. When we don't get it, when we think we should get it, that's when our continence changes, right? Think about that. When we pray a prayer and it doesn't happen just when we think it happens, all of a sudden our whole continence changes, even by our relationship with the Lord. God has a greater perspective of life, life's events, and his perspective, his plans, his schedules are perfect and holy, and because he is perfect and holy. The psalmist tells us, as for God, his way is perfect. If God's ways are perfect, then we can trust that whatever he does and whatever his timing is, is also perfect, right? When we come to grasp that fact, waiting on God is not only less difficult, it actually becomes joyful. But repeatedly throughout scripture, we see wait on the Lord. The Bible is full of exhortations telling us to wait on the Lord. Let's take a look at a few of them. Turn in your Bibles to Psalm 37, 7. I'm going to hit a lot of them, so I'm going to move kind of quickly. Psalm 37, 7 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his ways, because of the man who carries out wicked schemes. Let's try Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. A lot of you guys might already know this one by heart. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Therefore, the Lord longs to be gracious to you, and therefore he waits on high to have compassion on you, for the Lord is a God of justice. How blessed are all those who long for him or wait for him. Romans 8.23. Romans 8.23. Romans 8.23 says, And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even when we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. You don't have to turn here, but Psalm 40, verse 1 says, I wait patiently for the Lord, and he inclines me and heard my cry. And there are many, many more. Waiting is hard work, and at times it can even test our faith. It's especially difficult when there are no guarantees that our waiting will ever end in this lifetime. Think about it. Desires that we long for, prayers that we've been praying, news we've been, we are waiting to hear can tempt us to be impatient, discouraged, to worry, even to wonder if God cares. We all have that loved one that it seems like we've been praying for forever to get saved, and yet we see no inclination that they're moving closer to the Lord. What about that illness that we have been praying for, healing? What about the new job, our finances, or our children? Some of us have prodigals out there that we've been praying for forever. Please continue to pray for my son, Reggie. All have prayers that seem like they're never going to get answered. We ask the question, if God cares, why doesn't he answer my prayer? We all go through bouts of faithlessness or doubt, or maybe even there's times, maybe there's times, we get just a little angry with God because he hasn't answered our prayer, because we have to wait. Listen to this. 
If the Lord Jehovah makes us wait, let us do so with our whole heart. For blessed are all they that wait for him. He is worth waiting for. The waiting itself is beneficial to us. It, tri it tries faith, ex exercises patience, trains submission, and endears the blessings when it comes. The Lord's people have always been a waiting people. That was from Spurgeon. Waiting on the Lord. From Scripture, we know that God often delays answering prayers. But that's no formal accusation of a lack of concern by the Lord. Jacob did not get the blessing from the angel until near the dawn of day. He had to wrestle all night for it. Abraham, Abraham had to wait, though he was known as a man of faith. God had promised Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. But when the promise was given in Genesis 12, Abraham, Abraham and Sarah did not have any children. God continued to restate his promise to Abraham through the years. We see it again in Genesis 13, 15, 17, 18, and so forth. They still had to wait on the Lord. Abraham took Sarah's suggestion and had a son with Hagar, Sarah's handmaiden. But that wasn't the son that God intended Abraham to have. Abraham had to wait for God's timing. Paul besought the Lord three times that the thorn in his flesh might be taken from him. And he received no assurance that it should be taken, taken away, but instead he received a promise that God's grace would be sufficient for him. We know the story of Joseph. His brother sold him as a slave. Though he didn't understand all that God, what was happening, he trusted God to work out his plan in his time. Then, of course, we have Job. We have that little saying, the patience of Job, Hannah had to wait, David had to wait, and there are many, many more that had to wait upon the hand of the Lord. We know that the Lord cares and that he hears our prayers. Turn to Matthew chapter 6. Look at what the Lord says to us. And this is all, and, and, and again, as with the last message that I preached on prayer, this is not stuff that's not new to us. We all know these things. It's just, this is just a refresher to help us to, to, to renew ourselves and to get back on course if we've lost our way a little bit. Matthew chapter 6. You guys know this whole thing. Beginning at verse 25. For this reason, I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. It is, not life, it is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, then saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And so do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble for its own. He hears us. He hears our prayers. He knows what we need. Turn to 1 John. He hears our prayers. He cares. 1 John chapter 5, beginning at verse 14. And this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 
And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the, re the request which we have asked from him. He hears our prayers. It's right here in the scriptures. Psalm 66, you don't have to turn there, says this. If I regard wicked, wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. But certainly God has heard. He has given heed to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God who has not turned away my prayer nor his loving kindness from me. He hears our prayers. Wait on the Lord. One commentator wrote this. A man must stop, well, I'm sorry, a man must not stop listening any more than praying when he rises from his knees. No one questions the need of time of, of formal address to God, but few admit in any particular way the need of quiet waiting upon God, gazing to his face, feeling for his hand, and listening for his voice. Wait upon the Lord. I believe that Waiting on the Lord is something that we as Christians must strive to master. We must learn to wait patiently upon the Lord. It's about holding on tight, hoping with expectation and trust, knowing that our Lord is not making us wait just to see how long we can take it or just for kicks. Something is happening during that time of waiting. I believe that waiting requires two key elements. A complete dependency on God and a willingness to allow him to decide the terms, including the timing of his plan. Trusting God with the timing of events is one of the hardest things to do. We half jokingly pray, Lord, I need patience and I need it right now. It's not far removed from the truth how we often approach the matter of spiritual growth and the Lord's will. To wait on the Lord produces character in the life of the Christian in that it involves patience. Would you turn to James chapter, uh, James chapter 1? Or James, yeah, James chapter 1. Okay. James 1.4 says, And let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. The scriptures are full of encouragement to wait on him. Waiting involves a passage of time, which is itself a gift of God. Waiting is not something we just do while we get what we want, Waiting is the process of becoming what God wants us to be. What God does in us while we wait is as, is as important as it is what we're waiting for. G. Campbell Morgan wrote this, Wait for God. Waiting for God is not laziness. Waiting for God is not going to sleep. Waiting for God is not the abandonment of effort. Waiting for God means first, actively under command, Second, reading readiness for any command that may come. Third, the ability to do nothing until the command is given. I say amen to that. Amen. Waiting does not mean doing nothing. It's not a fatalistic resignation. It's not a way of evading unpleasant reality. Isaiah 40, 31 says, Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength, they will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired, and they will walk and not become weary. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. Wait upon the Lord. Wait, those who wait on the Lord are those who work because they know their work is not in vain. The farmer, for example, can wait all summer for his harvest because he has done his work of sowing the seed and watering the plants. Those who wait on God and go about their assigned tasks, confident that God will provide the means and the conclusion to their lives and the harvest to their toil. Wait on the Lord. Waiting is the confident, disciplined, expectant, 
activity and sometimes painful clinging to God, it knows that we will reap a reward. Waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord requires patient trust. We live by the adage, don't just stand there, do something. While God often says, don't just do something, stand there. That trust is a patient trust. Whether it has to do with our relationships, our finances, our careers, our dreams, our churches, we have to trust that God knows what he is doing. Psalm 23 is a perfect example of that. It provides a lesson on being still and waiting on the Lord. Sheep will not be at peace near rushing water, but they will lie content by still water, and that's where the good shepherd leads us. Isaiah 40, 11 says, you don't have to turn there, like a sheep, he will tend his flock. In his arm, he will gather the lambs and carry them in his bosom. He will gently lead the nursing you, waiting upon the Lord. What we must guard against is trying to make something happen in our own strength as we wait on the Lord. Turn to, turn to Psalm 130. Psalm 130, verse 5, beginning at verse 5. I will wait for the Lord. My soul does not wait. I'm sorry, my soul does wait. And in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. When we don't choose to wait on the Lord, we solicit trouble for ourselves. Remember how Abraham and Sarah, what Abraham and Sarah did by not waiting on the Lord for the child of promise? We can go through scripture and see where men and women of the Bible who took out on their own to do their own thing without waiting on the Lord and the results of that. Some of us could come up here and give a testimony of what we did in our life when we didn't wait on the Lord and what were the results of that. One commentator wrote this, waiting for God means power to do nothing save under the command. This is not lack of power to do anything. Waiting for God needs strength rather than weakness. It is power to do nothing. It is the strength that holds strength in check. It is the strength that prevents the blundering active activity which is entirely false and will make us true actively, actively impossible when the defi- definite command comes. We can't act on what God wants us to do because we've already stretched out in our own strength to do our own thing instead of waiting on the Lord. Anytime we fail to wait on the Lord and take matters into our own hands, even when we're trying to bring about something that God wants, it leads us to problems. When we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, we can allow God's work to work out the rest of the details waiting upon the Lord. When you feel the resistance, let it be a a reminder to go Godward. When When we have that desire to go and do things in our own strength, let's take a step back and look towards our Heavenly Father. Recalibrate the focus of your faith. Move the weight of your trust off of self where it keeps gravitating back to and consciously focus it back on God. Wait upon the Lord. Whether simply spare moments or seemingly endless days, waiting is no waste in God's economy. Indeed. It is in the delay and the pause and in the becoming aware of our lack of patience that he works to save us from self-reliance and revitalizes our faith and hope in him. 
Have you just said to yourself, you know what, I'm not going to move. I'm going to, if it kills me, I'm going to wait on the Lord. I'm just going to wait to see what he has for me. And you'll find you'll never be disappointed. Hebrews 6 says this, verse 12, so that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promise. Through faith and patience. We must have the faith to wait upon him. Patience comes with faith. Faith for the moment and hope towards the future. Faith feeds upon, I'm sorry, faith feeds hope. And when we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. It is only when we put our hope in Christ that we can wait with confidence and know we will not be put to shame. It seems that God allows us to experience disappointment in life to teach us that nothing else will truly satisfy or provide us with a, frame, a firm foundation to stand on. He is our foundation. He is our all in all. And we stand on him. And we stand on his promises that, that we've been reading about. All throughout his word about waiting on him. God's word is, alone is unshakable. We can wait for the Lord knowing that no matter how dark the night is, his light will break through in our lives. Bringing abundant joy through a more intimate relationship with Christ. Let me ask you something. When you wait on the Lord, what is something that happens as a result of you waiting on the Lord? You spend more time seeking his face, right? That's, not a, that's a good thing, right? Yes, indeed. Waiting on the Lord involves the confident expectation of a positive result in which we place our great hope. A hope that can only be re uh, realized by the actions of God. This expectation must be based on knowledge and trust, or we simply won't wait. Again, by waiting, we draw closer to him. That knowledge of knowing that he is who he says he, says he is, is going to result in a positive way for us. Those who do not know the Lord will not wait on him. And will, neither will those who fail to trust him. There's a whole formula here. But it's a whole formula for all of our lives, all of our lives. Trusting and having faith in our Savior, our Redeemer. We must be confident of who God is and what he is capable of doing. Those who wait on the Lord do not lose heart in their prayers. This is the confidence we have in approaching God that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. We know that scripture, right? First John 5. Waiting on the Lord renews our strength. Prayer and Bible study and meditation of God's words are essential. Is that, one, is that not one of the essential things that you hear from every pastor in this church all the time from this pulpit? Study the word. Pray, meditate upon his word. To wait on the Lord, we need a heart responsive to the word of God, a focus on the things of heaven, and a patience rooted in faith. Patience is the companion of humility and the enemy of pride. Patience in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. That comes from Ecclesiastics. One commentator said this, is it, it is the appropriate posture of the creature illuminated enough to say, God is sovereign and I am not. And it is not our own production, but the fruit of the Spirit. We should not despair when God tarries long. His response, tarries long in his response, but continue to patiently wait on him to work on our behalf. The reason that God sometimes waits a long time to deliver is to extend the goodness of the final outcome. We pray and we ask for something not knowing I've always believed that God is working in the heavenlies already to answer our prayers. 
I gave Simone an analogy some years ago when she was waiting on her, her husband of, of the, if when you mail a letter, snail mail, from China to come to Manassas, it's on the way, right? You don't know it, but it's on the way. I said, honey, just wait. God may already have that man for you. I wouldn't count on Willie, but. <laughs> no, I love Willie. But he was the one. He was the one. We didn't know he was right around the corner, you know. Wait on the Lord. We, sh we should not despise when God tarries long. We should just wait patiently. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Listen to this. As we are waiting, we should pray and give thanks. Let the waiting prompt you to pray. The summons to be patient in tribulation is followed with the reminder to be constant in prayer. A healthy life of prayer doesn't necessitate hours each day in the closet, but eyes to see the opportunity and a heart to seize upon the unexpected moments and seasons of waiting. Let's wait upon the Lord. Colossians 3.15 says this, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with the thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or in deeds, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Let me ask you all a question. When you're in the throngs of the season of waiting, what is the biggest battle that you face? I would venture to say it's the battle of the mind, right? When you say so? Psalm 27, 13, 27, beginning at verse 13, says this, I would have despised unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your hearts take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. When we are waiting, we fight the battle of fear, anxiety, fretfulness, and worry. Then we begin to imagine different scenarios in our heads. Now tell me that's not true. When you're waiting, all these things start running through your head, these different scenarios. What if this or that happens? What if I've been praying the wrong way? What if God doesn't answer my prayer? And what really is amazing is that we always come up with the worst case scenario as we're running through our heads, right? It's always the worst case. We need to remember who it is that we are talking about. And we need to remember his word. It is the gospel that has taught me that enduring strength and courage will never be found in myself, but only in Christ. Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you, ever. He is Emmanuel, God with us. That's a promise that will sustain us while we wait for answers to prayers. But even more as we wait for his triumphant return. We're waiting for that, right? God's goodness is promised for those who wait patiently for him. No matter how long, how long regardless of how hopeless things appear to us, even when it seems to cost us everything, God is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to his power at work within us. When we wait for him, we will never be disappointed. I'm running out of time here. I have a lot more. So, let me say this. Another casualty of, of, of long seasons of waiting is that we give up on our prayers. We stop expecting him to act while giving away to a spirit of cynicism 
rather than thinking God, thanking God for who he is and all he has done. This quote I found, never was a faithful prayer lost. Some prayers have a long voyage, longer voyage than others, but then they return with their rich cargo at last so that the praying soul is a, grainer, a gainer by waiting for an answer. God hears your prayers. While God may not answer our prayers in our timing or in the way we expect, he will accomplish his good purpose in our lives when we wait for him and preserve in prayer. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, guys, I know I ran a little long, but I want to ask you to be patient with me just, just a few more minutes for something very important, okay? Some of you are aware that we have, and I'm changing gears real quick here, so forgive me, okay? Some of you are aware, especially if you come on Thursday nights, that we have been praying for the underground church in the Middle East. This church has been supporting that